Hello, everyone. My guest today is Brian Real. He's a serial entrepreneur, uh, and his current company is called ProcessMaker.com. Before that, he founded and later sold a telecom in the telecom space, a long-distance voice and data carrier based out of South America. He graduated from Duke University in 1993 and was a Fulbright Scholar in Linguistics in Ecuador, 1994. Brian, are you ready to take us to the top? I am. All right. Tell us about ProcessMaker. What's it do and what's your business model? How do you make money? Yeah, so Process Maker is uh, is all about automating processes. So these tend to be request and approval processes. So basically anything that involves a form uh, that is pulling in data and is being routed for approval. So that's a bit of a mouthful. So to give you some examples, we're talking about credit requests, credit applications uh, for banks, and we have a lot of banking customers. We're talking about purchase requests for a lot of uh, manufacturing companies. We have a lot of manufacturing companies. And in higher ed, it could be something like a grade change request, a transfer request, a professor uh, ascension uh, process or request or any kind of change management type requests. Okay. And I mean, is this like plumbing that's going on behind the scenes? You're connecting APIs or? Yeah, good question. So it can be more plumbing, but it also can be less plumbing. So a lot of times it is actually the, the interface itself. And then it's got some plumbing behind the scenes. So we're connecting APIs to bring in data mostly from systems like core systems, ERPs, CRMs. And then we're sort of routing that for humans to make approvals and generate changes in the information, which gets put back in through the plumbing, back into the core systems, back into the ERPs or core system. So so when I bring up off the top of my head, some, some folks that I think about when I, when you give me that description, I think of segment, work auto elastic, Zapier, SnapLogic, Jitterbit kind of companies. What do you think when you hear those companies relative to what you do? Uh, so kind of jitterbits and, and Zapiers or snap logic, those would be a little m- more into a category called integration platform as a service. So we're in kind of business process management or BPM or workflow. So workflow and BPM has an element and overlap with the uh, integration platform. So we do do integration, but a lot of times we'll see customers that already have an integration platform, which is good news for us because then it makes it easier to get the data we want in and out. And we're going to be much more of the kind of human powered forms that are getting routed around. So uh, those kind of companies won't do very well with the approval and and rejection part of uh, a workflow. So the key element there is like it's some human form they're filling out. It's a PDF they're printing and scanning back to an email for something, things like that. Exactly. There's usually this idea of a validation Uh, in Europe. They'll call it kind of validations. We tend to look at it as approval, approval, reject decision moments. That's kind of where workflow comes in. Got it. That makes good sense. Uh, Tell me about the model. Is it pure SaaS or what's your revenue model? Uh, so it's not pure SaaS. We do both on-premise and SaaS. SaaS has been, as you can imagine, growing sort of faster in more recent years. Uh, the reason there's still a lot of on-premise is because this is deals with a lot of plumbing, as you mentioned, and it is very much mid-market and enterprise. So there's a lot of legacy systems, a lot of legacy systems where we're being brought in because we have greater flexibility, better front ends. Uh, but there are enterprises which are still doing a lot of that on-premise, so still want it, uh, still want it on-premise. So we do both. And and is the on-prem stuff though? Is it st- in terms of how it hits your cash flow statements or, or your balance sheets? I mean, this it's still a predictable annual kind of event, or no? Yeah, for us it's the same. It's still a uh, an annual subscription revenue we charge upfront. Yeah. Um, and, and they look and act the same way from a support perspective. They're a little bit different. Interesting. OK. And give me a general sense of the size of these bad boys. Are we talking 10 grand a year, 100 grand a year, a million a year or more? Uh, so we're talking sort of 25, 30 grand would be kind of average contract value for us. And, and that doesn't include potentially professional services, which might be done by us or by uh, partners around the world. So this is kind of mid market and above. Um, and it's tending, it's trending upwards for us as we go kind of further into mid market and enterprise type clients. Got it. And that's just to be clear, it's an annual $30,000 contract, right? Correct. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. Get, get, let's get more of your backstory here. What year did you launch the company in? Uh, so we launched process maker in 2008. The company was actually around for eight years previously. And we started under a di- totally different premise that sort of didn't work out and, Kind of almost uh, called it quits around, you know, around 2002, 2003, uh, but then kind of kept going with some different types of projects we were working on. And in about 2008, sort of discovered what we really wanted to do, which was workflow. 
and launched Process Maker as an open source project in 2008. Uh, we had sort of one employee then, and that's really when it when it sort of took off. And Define took off. Well, we are uh, organically kind of grown and have grown the, the business uh, very much organically since then. Does that mean you're so bootstrapped? Today, we're bootstrapped, yeah. So today we're about 140 employees worldwide. Uh, so that happened between 2008 and today. So not exactly sort of overnight, but that's, uh, I think for, for bootstrapping, that's it's never overnight, steady. Brian, we, you and I know <laughs> that it's never overnight, yeah, never overnight. All right. And where's headquarters? Is it Durham? It's Durham, North Carolina. Yes. Yep. Yep. Very interesting. Okay. So walk me through, I want to understand you said it in 2000, like early 2008, it quote, didn't work out. What, what wasn't working out and how did you have the intuition to know you got to change something? So we, we started a business in 2000. We set it up to do a reverse trading uh, auction site for directors and officers liability insurance. So okay, that about put me different. to sleep, so I know I didn't yeah. work. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so that turned out to be right at the, the back end of the, the dot-com crash, and uh, so it was very difficult to raise money. We sort of needed to raise money to do that. So we just, at that point, had a few uh, developers on staff. We ended up taking on some random projects and we were basically doing websites and database systems and then eventually got a customer and sort of reflected upon what we were doing and it looked and felt like workflow. So we started calling it workflow. Interesting. So, so to kind of survive there in the middle, you took on some custom, you know, lower margin, but higher contract, you know, you know, cash in the bank quickly kind of things to sustain yourself. Yeah. And we were, uh, my other co-founder went back to his day job. I had a day job. So we were basically doing whatever we could to just sort of keep the doors open for a period there. And you made it through that, that, that down point, I guess we'll call it. What are you at today in terms of total customers you're serving? So today, uh, around 350 customers, okay. uh, ar really around the world, um, uh, enterprise mid-market customers. And generally growing at what rate would you say? So we, we grow our subscription business around 30, 35 percent uh, a year. So, you know, we take a relatively conservative approach since it's our money and we well, want to make it. And you're bootstrap too. That's healthy growth for a bootstrap company. Yeah. You're in yeah, full so control of the cap table? Yes. You and your founder, co-founder? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, a couple of years back, we kind of helped, we cleaned it up a bit with a couple of good years we had, uh, just realizing that when you're, when you're bootstrapping, it really helps to have, have that control as you kind of mentioned. Uh, really, why really was it, why this is a really important lesson here. Cause a lot of entrepreneurs, when I dig, they do some form of cap table cleaning, especially if it's a company that's been around for a while with a bunch of pivots. Why was it quote dirty in the first place? In other words, how did people get on it in the first place? Was it friends and family and angel round or early employees? And how did you negotiate to kind of quote, clean it up? Yeah, good question. So it, it, as I mentioned, since we started off with a very much a, a different business plan, uh, we initially took on some friends and family money uh, that was in a that was under the assumption of the previous business plan, which had to do purely with insurance and reinsurance specifically. Uh, they had been around for a long time. So that sort of expectation of uh, a momentous sort of exit right around the corner uh, didn't happen for them. So we wanted to provide them a, a way out. And we had uh, one <clears throat> sort of interesting event along the way, provided some liquidity, some cash for us. So we decided, hey, it's a good time to to let those very early investors get out. And then it gives us gave us more flexibility going forward to sort of uh, manage the, the business in a slightly different way. And what was the fortunate event? Uh, we ended up uh, having a uh, small piece of small M and A transaction where we sold off an asset we had we had created uh, that's still under confidentiality. But we ended up building the workflow uh, that's deeply embedded in a in a, in a leading enterprise system. Um, ended up kind of learning our lesson because the the code slowly got forked. We realized it was going to be better to try and uh, sell that off, so we did. And then we took that cash and we're, we're able to clean it up and, and uh, pay a bit of a dividend. Interesting. I, I won't ask, obviously, the amount because you said you're still confidential. But in gen generally speaking, how many individual entities were you able to remove from the cap table as a result of that deal? Um, yeah, like uh, like 15. Oh, and, wow. And those were, yeah. So there were small, small shareholders who yeah. 
Um, you know, again, it was, they had been on for a long time. They were all happy to kind of move on and, and, and get money out. So, and give us a sense of kind of where you're at now. I mean, we're talking like four or five entities on the cap table between you and your co-founder plus maybe three or four others or, uh, really three and, uh, then, uh, yeah, well, three and then a few, five in total. Good. So significant cleaning. That's, that's good stuff. All right. Yeah. Now, now in terms, term, in terms of growth rate real quick. So you mentioned 350 customers, $30,000 ACV. That means you guys are what somewhere around that beautiful $10 million mark at this point. Is that about accurate? Approaching it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you, I, I saw you guys obviously on the Inc 5,000 in, in 2015 growing 130% year over year. I think you did five, five that year and 30% growth year over year since then will put you about 10, five now. Yeah. Yeah. A little, a little bit, numbers are a little bit different, but well, more or less there. It's harder to keep, it's harder to keep growing 133% year <laughs> over year as the numbers get bigger, but, but somewhere around 10 million, uh, in terms of where you guys are at, totally bootstrapped is obviously a great spot to be. Um, what are you focused on product wise moving forward? Are you focused at going and getting deeper and more wallet share from your current 350 customers or going out and getting new customers with new offerings? Uh, it's a good question. It's, it's, it's both, but we have taken a much closer look at our, our kind of current customers and realized that, uh, there's a lot of growth there that we hadn't been sort of realizing. So we're really focused on that this year. Uh, we've sort of become more honest with ourselves in terms of having landed clearly in mid market and above. We sort of entered the space, uh, thinking we were, I think not really thinking at all. So we sort of entered the space (laughs) looking at the, the kind of SMB or even smaller businesses realize that doesn't really work for this genre of product. Uh, so we've now we're kind of looking at the, the, the verticals we're competitive in and also looking how we can, how we can offer more value to existing customers. Tell me about churn. Uh, so churn, I think for us sort of that, uh, top level churn without the, the upsells, uh, it's about 12% annually. Um, I think for this kind of enterprise space, that's you know pretty normal. It's not kind of clear, clean SaaS where uh, you just get the customers on and they and they tend to stay on. For us, the challenge is actually getting the customer on because it's a a big decision. Customer has to be prepared to kind of put a team behind it, go forward uh, to see the value. And sometimes there's shifts in, uh, in management shifts in the decision maker. So that's one of the challenges there. Uh, and then we're, you know, approaching that sort of, uh, kind of zero to negative percent churn with, uh, with the upsells, but we think we can drive a lot more there. So gross revenue churn, call it 12%. Uh, you're, you're about net zero right now, which means your expansion revenue from your current base grows about 12% year over year. That's why you're at zero and you're working on getting that negative. Correct. As yeah. a bootstrapped company, you can't afford to pay a lot up front if it takes you one, two, three years to get the money back. What do you optimize payback period for? Uh, we actually optimize it for that that first year, and uh, meaning you know when we sell the um, when we sell it, we'd like to see uh, payback pretty immediately. So I would say even even less than that. Uh, most of our growth has been through, uh, organic kind of, uh, organic growth. So word of mouth and in inbound search engine optimization. So we haven't made really sophisticated calculations in terms of ex- extensive spend on the marketing side, but we would look for it in the first year. So even though we recognize lifetime values, probably sort of four years, four yep. and a half, five years, we just, uh, I tend to ignore that calculation. It can lie to you very easily sometimes. Yeah. And, um, we'll also balance it. We do, we do some interesting, um, upfront multi-year deals. So we get, you get a few of those in any given year and that can help, uh, balance out cash positions pretty well. So just to sum up those four unit economics real quick to make sure I've got them right. You like to optimize for a 12 month or less payback. It sounds like you're maybe even below that right now. If your first year ACV is about 30 grand, it means you're acquiring these guys for less than 30 grand a pop, sometimes much, much lower than that. That's fully weighted. You have a team of 140. I imagine some of them are sales. So it's fully weighted. You're direct paid plus any sales and marketing staff. Uh, and that puts your CAC again, right around that, that 30 grand mark at the worst case. Is that about right? Yeah. At the very worst case. So, yeah. you know, we're, we're, we're looking quite a bit under that in fact. So, uh, I've had people, um, recently, uh, say, accuse me of sort of leaving too much, uh, growth on the table. Yeah. Uh, is the term that that's been thrown at me a lot lately. And, and I think there is a trade-off between leaving growth on the table and kind of mitigating risk. And when it's, uh, when you're bootstrapping, you, I, I think you tend to kind of lean towards mitigating risk because that could quickly throw your formula out of whack. 
typically the only kind of people throwing stuff like that at you would be investors who want you to take their money, control you, and then use their money to jack up your CACs. Are you raising capital right now? Uh, we're not. Um, and in fact, in this case, it was, a, it was a marketer who obviously wants to spend more on yeah. marketing. And, and that makes sense. So at least we are, we are starting to get more aggressive there. Um, and we, um, but yeah, you're right. And it's also sort of the, the people that are looking to, to place money. If someone came and offered you, especially this, considering this is bootstrap and how clean your cap table is, if someone offered you call it 60 or 70 million bucks for the company, six or seven X AR, would you sell? Uh, we've sort of figured out that we need to go, we, we need to, we've got a few years ahead of us, uh, just in terms of making sure, uh, so one, we don't, we don't think somebody would come today. We need to, we want to line up a little more strongly in a few areas. Um, so, what do you mean by that? Uh, so we, we've, meaning, so sure, churn is, is under control today, but we think we can do a, a little better. So we want to get it clearly into negative territory. We want to make sure that in the verticals we've most recently identified, we've got the kind of growth rate we, 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 we want to grow at. And then on the product side, we're making a couple interesting changes. We want to have that story tightened down. Um, so either to make sure that we can get the, an optimal investor, if we wanted to get an investor under optimal terms. Uh, so we're thinking that we've got at least two years before we even look at anything like that. Interesting. Uh, to drive growth faster and do it in a non-dilutive way, would you ever consider venture debt? Uh, I've been hearing a lot more about debt options and actually looked into one uh, kind of recently. And I think if we if we identify um, the sort of lifetime value to CAC uh, ratio exactly and feel totally comfortable with it, then we might, you know, consider uh, doing something with with debt. I mean, today we're we're debt free, and it also means I can sleep more easily at night and not have to really worry too much. So that that's after rough startup days that those memories are still kind of present, and I tend to kind of want to avoid that stress. All right, Brian, let's wrap up with the famous five. What's the last business book you read? Uh, I'd say it's from good to great. Number two, is there a? Oh, sorry, name your favorite CEO to have dinner with in Durham. Um, I guess it would be Mark, Mark Benioff. <laughs> is he in, is he in, no, name like oh, a local. Oh, he's got to be in Durham. Name like a uh, local entrepreneur you really respect, yeah. Uh, that's a tough one. Maybe, um, maybe Joe Calopi who sold, uh, Bronto. Bronto, yep, yep. That was a good exit for that, that area. Uh, number three, what's your, besides your own, what's your favorite online tool? Uh, favorite online tool, Jira. Jira. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? I'd say six and a half. That's pretty good. And what's your situation? Married, single, you have kids? Married, three kids. Three kids. Are you empty nesting or no? No. All right. Really how, <laughs> and how old are you? 47. 47. Last question. Take us back to your 20-year-old self, Brian. What do you wish you knew? Uh, what do I wish I knew when I was 20? Um, that, yeah, that it, it can be a, 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 I guess I wish that uh, I had just established product market fit earlier. So I would look for that more quickly. Um, you're going to be like in your college dorm and just be thinking, Oh, I wish I had product market fit earlier or this was, <laughs> or did you already have your first company at that age? Uh, shortly thereafter. Okay. Um, all right, guys, there you have it from Brian. He's been through the fire. He's, he's learned the lessons. He's now, again, building Process Maker. They launched it way back in 2000, went through some pivots, cleaned some stuff up in 2008, 2009 timeframe. Now they're growing really health, healthily. Uh, did about 5.5 million back in 2015. Now up near the 10 mark, serving about 350 mid-market, uh, pushing enterprise-sized customers, each paying about 30,000 bucks per year in ACV, at least in year one. They are driving 12% expansion year over year, which more than washes out the 12% revenue churn. So they're right out about even there right now, trying to get to that negative area quickly. They've got 140 people with headquarters based in Durham. Again, Elf Unit Economic, super healthy. Brian, thank you for taking us to the top. Thanks, Nathan. Appreciate it.